It looks spectacular. What are you talking about? Oh my about? god. Listen, I'm going to steal the show just on oh this Oh my song. god. Should you shoot this thing and it's a podcast? Yeah. I'll put some powder on it. Okay. You'll need it. You're a little shiny up there. Yeah, I got it. I'm just going to Oh, you have the red watch with the red napkin? That actually, um, oh. napkin. You will wow. never see this watch again. I've seen that watch. No, you haven't. You've never yeah. seen this. Watch. I've seen this that watch, watch is called the Chronometer Bleu. It is Putin's watch. Really? There are very few in the world. Better give it back to. Oh, made by F. P. Jordan. Shooting this. <laughs> made by F. P. Jordan, one of the girl. rarest, rarest watchmakers. He only makes nine hundred watches a year. What do you think for that? I keep looking down every time, every stroke of the head. Let me help you. Just got a lot of shine. Don't screw it up, Barb. I won't. Yeah, especially on the edges. You know, your your skin is softer <laughs> on the edges. Okay. It looks good. Very I precise. I already showed you when you were in here, so okay. I'll just say, uh, okay. so Kevin, say hello. Great to be here, Barbara. You know I love to work with you this way. I don't think you do. You're always <laughs> complaining, complaining. Come on. But we've got great callers coming in. That's great. And it's kind of like a competition for me. It's kind of like who could give the best advice to the same answer. And I have a strong suspicion on that way. What do you think? Uh, I think I'm going to kill you in every respect. <laughs> okay, we'll see, Big Mouth. Let's All go. Right. Okay, let's hear the first call from Brian. Here let's we go. Hear. It's going to be in your ears. It's a strange one. You know, it's I, a sad one. It's very sad. I think, first of all, that, that's a that, that's a very broken relationship between a parent and a sibling and, and a you know, brother or sister. I don't like that story at all. I think what has to happen here is this individual has to strike out on their own and tell their parents, go fuck yourself. I mean, oh, my like, God. I'm going to have to delete that from my podcast. You yeah. know exactly what I'm saying. This is ridiculous. Even talking that way to a child is just something really wrong about that. And even the guy's voice, doesn't he sound beaten down? Yeah, just the tone of him, he feels he like does. he can't get himself I, I think going. he should use it as motivation to get out there and do his thing. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly that family is semi-dysfunctional in my view. Mm -hmm. Well, here's my advice to you, Brian. I think you should use the insult uh, for your motivation. Nothing is more powerful than somebody damning you to hell and saying you can't do something. Because it can get your ire up and you get out there and you say, I'll show you. So I would just go over to your parents and thank them for insulting you and saying, because of you, I'm going to show you what I could do. And you know what? After that, leave them behind. Forget about them. Come back as the victor. And they'll have to acknowledge it. And if they don't, you can acknowledge it for yourself. You're right, Barbara. Brian is the winner. The parents and the sibling are the losers here. Uh, but we haven't heard the parents side of the story. Yeah, yeah. But I can just tell it's bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll get on to the next question. Okay. I kind of agree with you on that. It's kind of weird. It is weird. I never agree with you on anything. I just, the guy sounded depressed. It's yeah. Who, who's the next person you'd like to hear from? Dawn. Third marriage. Listen, I'm going to take a stab at this, Barbara, because I have various feelings about marriage. Um, I've always felt that marriage, while it can be very euphoric in the beginning when romance and love are involved, really displays its true colors after about three years. It becomes oh, a business. Because the reason men and women or significant others get together and form family units is to help themselves economically and emotionally. But the fact is, it's the pillar of financial strength that keeps a marriage together. And so when you see someone whoa, contemplating... Whoa, 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 whoa. Let, let me finish my thought. How rude of you to interrupt right. your guest, Barbara. Okay. Let me finish my thought and then you can bring your irrelevant concepts forward. I'm saying here <laughs> that if you're talking about a third marriage... The first two tell the story of what's going to happen to the third. It's also going to go to zero. So, There's something wrong, Don, that you've really got to do a little soul searching about um, if you've been married twice and are even thinking about getting married a third time. Why bother? Why not just have some frenemies? To me, uh, to my ears, Dawn doesn't sound at all like she is even excited about getting married. I don't know why she's asking the question. But I would agree with you again, I hate to say, that I think she needs some therapy. What went wrong in the first marriage? What went wrong in the second marriage? And why would you want to repeat it? Hmm? Right, I don't get Barbara, it. I want to bring a point up I think you may or may not agree with. But if you look at, I did this little study on divorce over a 7 to 14 year period. Why would you study divorce? Well, because I was very interested in answering this question. And I had a good friend who was a divorce lawyer, had been for 35 years. So I asked him, can you just, don't bring up the individual cases, because he, he did a lot of work with very wealthy people. 
50% of unions end in divorce between 7 and 14 years. That's a stat that's been pretty steady for a long time. It's not um, infidelity that breaks these unions apart. In most cases, he attributes it to financial pressure. Oh, I'm sure. Even the super rich. That's always been the case. One partner is not in sync with the other in terms of their spending, investing habits, or whatever it is, and that brings such a fissure to the family that they divorce for the reasons of money. So I'm just wondering if that hasn't played a role in Dawn's case. Maybe Dawn's a spendaholic, and her husband wasn't happy, or her significant other didn't like that. But if you're having trouble in your marriage, look at money first, not infidelity. Most marriages can survive infidelity. All right, we're moving on. All right. I think Diana needs aggressiveness training more than she needs good advice. I can't imagine. She's a little kumbaya, her. don't you find? Absolutely. Can you picture her confronting any uh, situation and saying, or maybe her boss, hey, what's in it for me? Uh, I'm going to leave. I can't even imagine. She's going to be there forever. But I'd love to ask her what's not fulfilling and how about just trying to get a better position where you're working now? Oh, that's a good point. I told my daughter the same thing after her first year of work. You know, she came to me complaining about her status in the organization and her pay. After one year? No. I said, we're not even going to have this conversation until we've gone 18 months because, uh, and we did, we had the conversation <laughs> again actually after 24 months, two years. And then I said to her, you know, Savannah, you've achieved quite a bit. You uh, need to get a raise. I'm going to tell you what to say. But really, it's all about what you've delivered because you get set some goals for yourself, you've achieved them, and now you have to get a raise. And she was quite successful, not as much as I wanted her to get, every father wants her to get more. But she moved up in terms of two positions in her job title and a very significant... And a raise in one? All at once. Wow. I, and this is why I'm going back to, to this caller, because you have to set goals for yourself. Generally, I don't like to look at resumes where people have moved every 12 months. I like to see a two-year commitment. Even it's nice, but it's so forgivable today. I think it seems to me as though it's a typical resume. But you're okay with a 12-month I don't like it, but I tell you, most of the resumes that come in, people hop around, especially when they're young. I don't mind it at all. I used to really be bothered well, I'm still old-fashioned in the respect that I think you should show the organization what you can do, and that takes at least 24 months. So I, I, you know, I said to her, look, you're not going anywhere until you really prove yourself here and be the stepping stone, and she has. She's now in her third year and looking at another race. So I like to tell people, set a goal for yourself. Once you achieve it, go point out to your superiors that you did exactly what you'd set out for yourself and for them, and that you'd like to be compensated accordingly. You know, Kevin, I get a lot of people that call in and are stuck in jobs, and they seem to put enormous value under uh, over a family-friendly environment, as though they are afraid to leave because they could go to their soccer, the kids' soccer games and what have you. But what do you think about that? I'm, my impression is that uh, most jobs today are family friendly. Things have changed. And for people to get stuck in a job just because they think they're understood, like this lady Diana, I think is a mistake and it holds people to a job much longer than they wish to be. You're right. Most bosses, most people that are running both entrepreneurial organizations or large corporations understand people. Um, should be measured by their ability to achieve tasks. How they do it, it uh, doesn't really interest me. As long as they achieve them, I don't care where they do it from, as long as A, they achieve them, B, they achieve them, and C, they do it on time. And after that, you can be eclectic. You know, you can work in different ways. Most organizations are bending that way as long as they achieve their goals. And I think it's a good thing in America, frankly. Of course, we're going with that. Lifestyles have changed so much. Even people that tell me, look, I want to work all night. I'm a night out. Okay, I'm cool with that. Let me give one uh, little piece of advice to Diane. Diane, I think you're going to have a hard time asking for anything, and you're going to have to practice being aggressive. And I started out that with that point because that's what I hear between every word you say, that you're not aggressive and you're not confrontational. So I would suggest you go out and see what other jobs are out there, if even online, so you know there's other opportunities. And then you go look at yourself in a mirror and practice saying what you need to say to move on or practice what you need to say to get a, get a raise or to get the new promotion or to argue your worth. But I think with the way you represent yourself, you're not going to get anything because I'm not convinced listening to you that you believe in yourself one bit. And I think uh, that's at the core of the issue more than being stuck in the job. I think you have to be able to learn how to advocate for yourself. Well, Barbara, telling it like it is, you're mean. I'm not mean at all. I just think that would be so useful. It would give you the power you need to represent yourself. And I don't hear it in your voice, and I don't think it happens overnight. you got to practice on it. I was like the quietest, 
uh, lowest key kid in the world and I'm a big mouth. Why? Because I practiced for so many years being a big mouth. You got to get out there and practice or just even practice in front of your family and friends to get accustomed to the sound of your own voice being aggressive. That's all. Barbara, okay. so happy we're not dating. Oh God, I would I would chew you up, Kevin, if I was dating you. Because you know, the first time you took me on a date and you're speaking about your daughter, and I hope you recollect this. Yeah. You took me to a fancy restaurant, asked me to give you a lovely daughter when she was first starting out, some real good business advice. She yeah. admired me yeah, yeah. and it would be lovely if I could dedicate an evening. I think it was the first, second year of Shark Tank, maybe so, ten years. Did you? And so I went out on the date yeah. and I spoke to your daughter and I gave her everything I could to help her get started. It's and very kind at of the end and at the end, when the uh, check came and Did the waiter the waiter put it in the middle of the table and yeah. you turned to me and you said, are you going to pick that up? Oh, yeah. That's what I like. And about. you invited me. And That's I think for what you, I like about me. You life. and your daughter. You know, I haven't gotten we're that. You're such a cheap You know, what God. I should have done is said, let's go 50-50. Oh, God almighty. <laughs> I still love to tell that story. I'm getting even every time I, I talk. You tremendous. are a cheapskate. No all right, doubt. Barbara, okay. I'm going to give you 20 bucks for dinner. I hear you're cooking for me. <laughs> It's about all it's worth, I'm afraid. <laughs> Dustin. Okay, let's hear from Dustin. So, actually, as I listen to Dustin's details about that business and the seasonality aspect of it, I think I'd whack one of the employees completely. <laughs> and, um, oh, i got to delete that, too. My God. No, I'm serious, because he's he basically he has overcapacity in terms of labor. He's, he's hired too many people. What he needs to have is a full time that he's you know getting the full forty to forty two hours a week out of. If he went down to one person to get that, and then go into a part time contract with the others as the seasonality drifts through the business. He has not tailor made his business model correctly because of the seasonality. He detailed about winter time and putting up signs, etc. And so, but the bigger problem is if he doesn't have what it takes to actually make hiring and firing decisions, he shouldn't be running the business. He maybe could be an investor in it, but he's got to get somebody that has the guts to tell the truth to these people. One of them has to go, in my view, and the other can be put on a part-time basis or find work elsewhere. Let me ask you this, Kevin. The first time you fired someone in your own business, the yeah. first time you had to confront firing someone, taking their livelihood away, did it come naturally to you or was it a tough thing to do? No, it was tough. Um, what I have in my career as I grew my, particularly my consolidation in the educational software business, ended up firing tens of thousands of people. And I learned the most important thing to do in that whole process was to set up um, a system where A, you explained why it was happening, B, you found out and made sure you compensated them very fairly, because what I learned when you're dealing with that many people, they are going to go into the market and talk about you being fair or not. And in my case, we made sure that we compensated them and found counseling services to help them find other jobs. And by the time the fourth year came around, as we were buying companies, firing the people we didn't need, just keeping the developers because we had our own distribution, um, the rep our reputation was very good. And many of them came back and worked for us two or three years later mm -hmm. as they moved around the market because we ended up being the largest educational software company in the world. So these people came back that wanted to be in the educational business. Well, that, that addresses uh, one of his concerns that uh, the people wouldn't like him, they might not come back, and you found that they did. I found If they're, if they're treated them, fairly. If they're treated fairly, but no one goes into a firing situation initially as a boss, a new boss, and feels comfortable firing people. So oh, it's like, tough as hell. I would say to Dustin uh, this, he's a very nice guy, we could hear that in his voice. He has a conscience, he wants to be a good guy all the way. But he's got to learn to fire, and that's a trait. You, that's an ability you can certainly learn. But I would say to Dustin that he could trade on how nice he is. I don't think he realizes how much loyalty he has in his firm because you can tell he's a nice guy. So if he sits down with a yeah, group but of you employees, you mean bad economic decisions because you don't have the guts to trim costs. Yeah. All right. So that's the downside. But here's the upside: he's probably the loveliest boss in the world, and the people love him. So if he sits down with a group of people, a one-on-one, -on -one, and says, "Hey, listen." The business isn't right. We don't have the billable hours that we used to have, so we're going to have to cut the hours that everybody's working. And I can either guarantee you 20 hours, or if you want, you could leave here and you could get a full-time employment somewhere else. But that's the best I could do for you. I don't think the firing for Dustin is going to be nearly as tough as he thinks. I think people are going to get it. I think he's going to learn that firing isn't the boogeyman he thinks it is, and he's going to do a good job at it. Because people love me. 
Everybody loved me, it worked for me. But in the initial time, people took it in the chin and they said, we understand, and they walked out the door. It happened. And so I think we've got to give Justin a chance to realize it's not as bad as he thinks, just go do it. And people are going to be more loyal than he thinks. I'm too worried you're sending out too much of a kumbaya message. It's not a kumbaya. Message. It's because training business, on what's good. I get He's it, but guy. I would rather have employees respect me and feel that they I was treating them fairly. Love and respect aren't necessarily like, yeah, opposed yeah, to each yeah, other. Yeah, He's got, he could have certainly both respect and I don't and need love. everybody to love me, Barbara. I want them no to respect me. No one does. Me. This is great. Well, then I have no problem. <laughs> If they know I'm going to be fair, though, particularly in business, you've got to be fair because that comes back to hurt you economically. Businesses are about making money. They're binary. Either you make money or lose it. But you're a way to kumbaya. I am not. Kumbaya. I'm the best fire I know, I, and it's about how you do it. And I think well, this guy's got a good shot at I'm doing it. I'm pretty good at it, too, and I think I take a different approach. They love me, and We're they come on. back. They come back because I'm fair. I'm sure. That's and why, you're lovable. Barbara, there is, a reason, there is a reason I'm called Mr. Wonderful. You know that. <laughs> what is that reason? There's truth in advertising. Here's Jenna. Oh God. Jenna, let's go. Okay. Uh, let me say something to you, Jenna. First off, uh, you sound, it sounds like you're a high school girl. It sounds so young the way you're expressing your problem and how you're dealing with it. Uh, my advice would be to you to talk to your friend, the one that you're having an issue with at the moment, and although it sounds like you have a lot of issues with a number of your friends along the same path, but talk to them directly and say, hey, what's up? I'm going to be successful. This is what I'm doing. Is there going to be room in your life for me? What's bugging you? What's in the way? I suspect you haven't really confronted it in a very direct way. And that's the only way you get communication going and keep a friendship going. If you have to watch what you're doing and fearful of hurting people and they're not approving you, that's not a friendship. you got to move on and find some happy people to be around. But I don't think you gave it a shot. I think you have to directly... Uh, speak about it and, and ask for a direct response. That's how you do it. One more thing. If I was your friend listening to what you said, um, I would think, uh, what's in it for me, this friendship? Uh, you might not have anything uh, in the friendship for your friends if you're successful. So maybe what you ought to do is share your success in a different way, not by telling them how you dream and want to be terrific, but maybe share your success in a different way. Get them tickets out to a restaurant. Uh, invite them for a long weekend vacation. Let them see the benefit of having a friend who's doing very, very well. And that will sweeten it up a little bit uh, as well. Because why would I want to be your friend if I'm just going to be jealous and you're not sharing your, your uh, success with me? That's all. That, that would be my spin on it. Barbara, are you suggesting that Jenna buy her friendship? Yeah, I am. Why oh not? I goodness. buy my friends all the time and mm. they really like it. Well, I have different advice, uh, Jenna. I want to talk about your presentation skills, which will be affecting you in life in many ways. You should listen to this podcast a second time about what you read to us. You used the word like about 30 times. Wow, is that true? Yeah, That's a yeah. good catch. And, I didn't and see it's, that. And I really, it's, it's like, you know, Jenna, You like, just use like. I'm, I'm trying to make a point here, Barbara. <laughs> okay. um, it, it makes you sound... Um, let me put it to put it to you this way: You sound twenty percent off retail. You really want to somehow clean that up and think about who you're speaking with, because you're now in a, in a broader audience. Think about when you make a presentation like the one you just gave Barbara and I. Did you want to be concise? You want to bring your point forward quickly. I thought you could have done that better, but the constant use of the word "like" is very high schoolish, very immature, and yet you are bringing a very mature topic forward about the jealousy of friends and your understanding the challenges of keeping it all together, um, the social issues involved, that's very mature. But throwing like in every third word is just, I don't like it. Like, <laughs> it like sounds like, you know. Anyways, think about that, Jenna. Thank goodness we met. I'm gonna clean that mess up for you right now. <laughs> okay, we're moving on. Yeah, I think so. I think I made my point. All right. Who do we have next? Something about inheritance. With no name. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Right here? Um, I don't think you gave us your name, so I'm going to call you no name. But listen, no name. Um, to inherit that much money, and by the way, uh, $2 million is significant. When you think about the average American family in the country you're thinking about coming to, it sounds like it makes about $58,000 a year. You're a very wealthy person in that context. The challenge you have is you're so young, you don't have the experience in how to invest it. So what I highly recommend to you is you find an advisor 
uh, that will protect you against yourself. Because what happens to young people is they don't understand, you know, that the risk inherent in getting too concentrated, in other words, the biggest free lunch in investing is diversification into bonds, into stocks, into other things that produce income, but you don't know how to buy those yet. It took me a long time to learn myself. Good news is most large American institutions, banks included, have advisory services that cost about 0.45% well, up to 90 point, or 0.9% or 1% in some cases. So you're probably going to make 6% a year if the markets are kind to you over a long period of time. You're going to pay 1% to your advisor and clear 5% of $2 million. That's more than 99% of people make in America, my friends. Are you recommending he does that? Comes to America and gets an advisor? And what's the advisor? Well, wherever he is, I don't know what the advisory business is in, in Kistanaban, if that's where, where is he? Is Kazakhstan. He's Kazakhstan. He's in Kazakhstan, I can say that. I'm sure there are advisors there, but I think the largest market, the most liquid market on earth, is right here in the United States. So and it's, it, it, what it sounded like to me, he was interested in the U.S., so if he's coming here, I'd definitely put an advisor in place. Well, I would uh, do something totally opposite to that myself. Don't tell him to buy real estate. Property, no, no, please. no, not. I don't think you should do a damn thing with your money. I think you ought to lock it up and not lose it. And I don't think you should be telling people you even have it to invest, because people will find you, and you'll hear the best pitches in the world as to how they're going to make money with your money. And I think you're in a very dangerous position. I mean, I'm even kind of surprised that you called in and said how much money you have to us, total strangers. It's pretty shocking, all right? I want to grab your money, and you're not even here for me to grab Shame it. Shame on you, Barbara. No, but I do. It's like, whoa, I get my hands on that money, and everybody will respond to you that way. Such a I think you should come to the United States if you can, uh, and that's a good question. Can you come to the United States, and can you get a job? Come, get a job, make a living, pretend you don't have the money two years from now, You'll have a much better understanding of what you're in for, what you should do for the money, who you should trust. Because in the end, when it comes to not losing money, never mind even making money, but just not losing it, you have to trust. And how do you make that assessment when you're so young and naive? So come, get a job, get some maturity on your back, and then decide how you might spend that money. But I would be very careful, and I would lock it up away from you and away from everybody else. Rob, Raphael, Raphael. Oh, a name, a name. Okay. He was just about to say how much he loved Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> I could tell us when he was lady. rudely cut off. That's a shame. Hey, listen, at 24, I'll tell you what I was doing about money. I was bouncing checks all over Manhattan. I would write checks for this and that, never balance my checking account, and I couldn't repeat visiting the same stores because I knew who I was. I was terrible with money. I didn't know how to manage it. And why was I terrible? Because I had never been exposed to it. Lucky for me, I started making more money than checks I could bounce. If not for that, I think it's, I'd still be bouncing checks. Of course, this is not the right answer. No, it's not truth. really. And I'm gonna, I, I will give Raphael the right answer. He's come to the right place. Disregard anything Barbara just said there. Here's what you have to do. And I found this to be true. In I have a second part of what I want to say, but I'll well, wait for you. I think you should wait till he gets the facts. Okay. So here we go. So <laughs> I found this to be true in every country, every language, every geography. People buy too much crap. Everybody does that. You can check your crap index by going into your closet and looking at all the clothes you don't wear. You bought, you wore once, you never wore again. The truth is, particularly for women, look at the shoes they don't wear anymore. Look at the handbags they don't use. Look at men's number of pants they don't wear. They stick to the same three, or the same four suits. I'm telling you, Raphael, right now, I could save you 10 to 15% a week by just being on your shoulder saying, don't buy that crap, Raphael. Don't buy that crap. You don't need that crap. <laughs> Every time you buy something, you should ask yourself, do I really need this? Do I really need to pay $2.80 for a cup of coffee when I can make it for 15 cents myself? Oh, oh my God. I'm serious. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can save people 15% all day long. And then they take this money and they save it, and it compounds at 6 to 7% a year during your whole lifetime. And if you do that, you'll find, even if you're only making the average income in America of $50,000, $60,000 a year, you can retire a millionaire by just saving 10 to 15% of your paycheck each week, which is very easy. Now, Barbara, maybe you couldn't do that, but most people can because you, too, have too much crap. I've been to your place. You have a lot of crap. <laughs> oh, God. Um, I had very good advice when I was about 28 that kind of turned me around, even though I was still not managing my money well at all. 
someone had recommended to me that I get I put my credit cards aside. I couldn't get rid of them. I was living on a credit card then, especially in bad times. But someone recommended to me that I pay cash for only one week. And I paid cash for everything in one week. And I was shocked at where my money was going. That, for me, was probably the only education I ever got in managing money. Just seeing where my money went in one given week. And it turned me around a bit. It made me feel like I had control of my money. And then I started paying off my lowest credit card balances first until I was able to pay off all those credit card balances. But uh, I was late to learn it. So give yourself a break. How old did you say you were? You say you're 24 and you didn't learn it from your parents. You got plenty of time to learn. But definitely ignore Kevin's advice. You won't have a good life. You won't have nice clothes to wear. You won't really say how wonderful this life was when you finally died. Forget about it. No, that's ridiculous. No, it's You've not. You've done a it's huge not. disservice. No, no, no. Raphael, come on. she is the sign of darkness and evil. I am the light. Remember that. Oh, God. We'll go on to Rhonda. She's next. Here's Rhonda. Thank you. Wow. Oh, God, no. Oh, oh my that's God. A, you know, I really, really think that's an interesting question. I will take the first step. <laughs> okay. Hold on, let's listen. Yeah, Rhonda, you're up. All right. Okay, so her husband dies. Yes. There has to be a period of mourning out of respect. Why is that? Barbara, you savage. Well, let's say the marriage was a miserable marriage. Well, we don't know that. We're gonna no, let's let's take the case. Let's just take wonderful. the case that she was widowed, not because she mm -hmm. wanted to, but her husband died unfortunately before she did. And they had a great marriage and they were a wonderful couple. Let's just take that example to start with savage beast. Now, I would think a ninety day period of mourning and celibacy would be appropriate. Ninety days. How did you arrive? At that? I just thought, in terms of you know the shock of a death and families and friends and all the people that want to take you out for dinner and stuff to help you with your mourning, I don't think you want to be bringing dates out at that time. I just think it'd be inappropriate. And maybe people would think, well, this is a little crazy. She's just lost her husband a week ago and she's dating somebody. I don't think so. I think three months is reasonable. What do you think? Not at all. I think the minute after your husband passes away, the minute you're attracted to someone, raises your eyebrow and you think, hmm, he looks interesting, you're already ready. There's no, <laughs> no, there's no period of mourning that's, that's dictated by anyone. It's, it's nonsense. If you are lonely and you're attracted to someone, go for it. The only way to get over loneliness is love. So what are you holding back for? Wow, no, no, Barbara, no. that is just crazy. I think it'll, it'll be upsetting to some people. Now, let's take it a step farther because she said relations, which obviously can mean sex, right? I would so, think so. Now I'm going to make a suggestion here. So the husband's dead. Okay. You meet oh. somebody. Let's leave. You know, I said 90 days. You're saying the next day is fine. Actually, at the funeral, if you see somebody, you're suggesting she should go ahead on. That's crazy. But anyways, <laughs> now you're dating. First date, you're interested. That's exciting. You've got that euphoria. I think it's wonderful. But I'm not advocating sex on the first date. I'm saying, say, look, I'm interested in you, and I'd like to see you again. Let's go out maybe on Friday. Maybe this is Wednesday date. And then it's really passionate, but we're still not ready for the big move. I like the third date for that, l'action. That's what I think is appropriate. Action on the third date, really, that builds momentum, crescendoing with a great outcome, and it's the beginning of a new relationship. And of course you're agreeing with me, Barbara. That's the way to do it. I'm being entertained by you and I agree with you. <laughs> what are you well, suggesting? Sex I, in the first five minutes at the no, funeral? No, no, I don't know. Yeah, you mean you, you run up behind the coffin? and <laughs> well, You're nuts. Throw yourself out of the coffin, sure. Well, what do you think? I think the minute you feel like you want to have sex, you should just go and have sex. She's a single woman, even though you call her a widow. She has no commitment. And just make yourself happy. Life's too short. What if the next month you're in the coffin? You're going to say, gee, I shouldn't have waited. No, no, no. You just got to go on and live your life. All this other stuff is nonsense. But the most nonsensical part is that you're giving love advice. Because you're probably the least lovable guy anybody no, no. has ever met. Actually, and everybody knows I'm immensely romantic. And my advice is taken by <laughs> millions of millennials. I really am a very good study on how you should do courtship with Barbara. And you would really be, you, you should listen to me. I would give you some great advice because I think the advice you're giving now is just <laughs> catastrophically bad. 
And shame oh, on you. Oh my gosh. You have to you need to build momentum in a relationship. You wanna you wanna have a little something, a certain je ne sais quoi, as I call it, the little magic, the little something you're waiting for, that something that the next date and may what happens, deliver. What happens after that big third date? No, because you're you all, by then you know a lot about somebody. You actually got the what I would call the pillars of building something special. Listen, you know, Mr. Wonderful knows this is how you do it. Barbara. You know, you started but, out earlier on this podcast yeah. saying that uh, you think that a marriage after three years becomes a business event, a yeah. business relationship. It does. Okay. But I'm talking about the euphoric period at the beginning. I'm giving you advice to really milk as much euphoria as you can get because don't worry, reality is going to strike. And the marriage is going to turn into what it really is, a pillar of financial stability. And that has merits too. But, you know, you've got to really think through. You can't tell me you have the same euphoria after 20 years that you had the first time you met. I don't know. I've met a lot of couples that can keep that going. Yeah. Seriously. That is yeah. complete bullshit. But anyways, you really think so? No, no. No, no. It's a different kind of love. It's a love built on respect and financial strength. It doesn't mean you but can't have suggest, great sex. No, you're, suggest, you're suggesting it not be romantic. I know many couples that are intensely romantic it's just you don't have it i love you I, I love that you dream but i'm giving real advice and you know i'm, I'm also deal with a lot of friends a lot of my friends have been divorced three times and i'm giving them advice saying you should not get married again this is enough already i've known all your wives i've been to all your marriages one of them i've been to four <laughs> four marriages and look don't invite me anymore i mean come on i've seen this dance so many times and, you know it's the last one was just off the charts and it was a very big span, fireworks, the whole thing in a foreign country, millions of dollars put to work on it. I said to my friend, look, you got to stop doing this. This is crazy. I can show you a much better investment for $2 million than this. <laughs> and she would have hung out with you anyways. You know, he's like 60 something and she's 27. You know that's going to last forever. Right till he's dead next year. Oh God, that's so crazy. <laughs> can I get an answer as an example? Uh, Troy, when I, I paid off my student loan debt when, I guess it was six years once I was working. Six years later, I paid it off. And uh, you know what I did? I ran on credit card debt as a result of that. I felt free and I just charged a lot more. I felt entitled. If I had it to do over again, I would just pay that over the whatever lengthy period of time I had to pay it over and, uh, and keep it because it kept me in check somehow. I think it depends on your personality. Now, I know... Kevin's going to tell you pay off the credit, pay off the uh, student loan immediately, and get get your head straight. Are you going to say that? I am, and I'll tell you no. why. Student loans have actually gone to floating rate, and uh, while it's very easy to service them now as rates are low, what people do is they don't take the opportunity to realize, wait a second, even if the student loan rates are four to five percent, which is where they sort of are right now. Some of those down from that. Though, no, they're, they're they're sort of on average about. I was looking at it the other day, I think it's about 4.2%. You know how hard it is to find a fixed income security that gives you 4.2%? Pretty well impossible to find. So the way you gotta look at it is, if you could pay that debt off faster, get rid of it, you could then invest in things that would may, maybe be better for you because you're actually giving somebody more than you can make in the market. Nobody can make 4.2% on a bond anymore. It's virtually impossible as you're taking huge risk, duration risk. So I'm, I'm a big advocate now when you get these floating rates at 4.2, 4.3, I think I saw one that was as high as 6.2 because they hadn't paid anything off in five or 10 years. I'd get rid of that student loan, particularly if you have money, and then put it to work. Most things you can buy, the market's giving you 2.3% dividend yield right now if you just bought the S&P. So I, I really, I, I don't like debt. I, I would certainly want to get out of it. And this whole thing of you're using debt to just you know, for you, Barbara, put little shackles around you from spending habits. Depends on your personality, though. That's ridiculous. That's compulsive kind of, wasting money. That's terrible. Not everyone has that same discipline. Though. Well, I think that's that's the, really the big question. Does he have the discipline to, to pay this off and start investing for the long term? So don't give advice to, by saying, you know, go get credit cards. Shame me, Barbara, really. This is uh, terrible. Okay. There you have it. Very well. So that was not in questions we did. Yeah. We've, we've done a little 16, research yeah. and found that 22 to 24 minutes is where the algo is. How could you do research? What we did is we actually field? did 30 plus of these things. Yeah. And then we went and talked to the guys that run the algorithms and said, how come we're getting 300,000 views on this one and 86,000 on this one? Length. So the, the Are you talking about video, though? Well? No, but, you know, we did them both. We did podcasts. Big, big, 